The LCI, Landing Craft Infantry, has spearheaded amphibious attacks all over the world. A powerful transport weapon of the United Nations, it has proved itself indispensable. But its fine performance is no surprise to the United States Navy. A model had demonstrated the boat's capabilities long before the first LCI touched an enemy shore. Here at the David Test Basin, the Navy tests and develops new craft of all types. When the first LCI was still nothing more than a set of blueprints, Admiral Howard and Captain Saunders, directors of the basin, went over its specifications. And a few hours later, workers began to build a model hull. They glued carefully cut pine boards, dulled them into place according to plan, and dovetailed the joints. The glue was set under the giant press. When the crude hull was ready, they moved it bottom up to the shaper. Templates for every few inches of surface guided the whirling knives that bit deep into the wood, shaping it, leaving behind neatly curved planes that were later trimmed by hand to the nearest thousandth of an inch. To avoid loss of speed or power, the basin tests scale model propellers on each hull. Templates for these were rolled to a given curve and used to route out a wood block to form a mold. Soft metal propellers were poured in the wood and finished by hand. Then when the hull was ready, the dynamometer was installed for power. The craft was trimmed with weights to give it the right balance. It was ready for testing. Night and day shifts had finished the complicated and precise scale model in three days. Workers moved it into the deep basin, where in the vast testing tank, the embryo LCI could prove itself. This 42-ton carriage, driven by electricity and oil at speeds up to 18 knots, can be controlled to two one-hundredths of a mile an hour. Rails set to the curvature of the earth guard against gain or loss of speed from gravity. Here and in other tanks in the same building, Models can be tested for lines, power, design, outboard devices, underwater rigging. Even projectiles can be studied. Such tests in miniature save hundreds of tons of metal, thousands of man hours and labor, and valuable time that the Navy cannot afford to lose. The model is attached to the carriage, which acts as a guide and a control room. The boat moves under its own power. On the carriage, instruments tell the engineer every fact about the performance of the ship. When the connection is made fast, the engineer signals the operator at the controls, and boat and carriage move forward together.
When the basin had finished its tests on the LCI, there was no guesswork left. The Navy knew, and the craft went into production. But as fast as one test is completed, another is begun. Here, for instance, a model aircraft carrier moves toward a launching trial in another part of the building. Hundreds of miles away in a naval shipyard, a huge carrier lay ready to be launched in a narrow channel. The problem, how far would the carrier ride? How quickly could it be stopped? This model told them the answers. Admiral Howard sent his recommendations to go ahead with the launching. The big carrier slid down the waves and rode just 10 feet short of the mark indicated by the test. Behind the ships at sea, backing up the interminable work of the drawing boards and the sweat of the shipyards, the Taylor Basin is constantly at work, giving the Navy ships that any commander is proud to take into battle. This is a typical high school in the American state of California. These 16 to 18 year old students have demanded a place in the war effort and they have been given one. They're too young to be in the army or work full time in industry. So the school itself has set up a shop for them to work in. And work they do. These young student volunteers make parts for a Southern California aircraft company. They spend four hours a day on books and four on the production line. They get school credit for the time spent in the shop and regular wages. All the work must pass the same rigid requirements met in any war plant, and it does pass. Army and Navy Air Force inspectors are delighted with the fine job these enthusiastic girls and boys are turning out. At another aircraft plant, they're trying out a different youth power plant, boy power this time. Cooperating with the Board of Education, this plant has made the experiment of hiring high school boys on a part-time basis. A few skeptics were afraid that the youngsters would prove too irresponsible, but they were mistaken. The boys work side by side with the older men. They have the lowest absentee and lateness record of any group in the plant. Foremen rate them as highly as old timers for working at a swift pace and keeping it up. Some of them make machine tools for final assembly. There isn't any job too big or too little for them to handle. According to the plan, they work an eight-hour shift for a month, go to school for a month. And here's how they feel about it. Says Tom, I'm not doing as much as I'd like to, but at least it's something for the war effort. Says Dick, I want to be a Navy flyer when I'm old enough. This will have to do in the meanwhile. Says Harry, guess I never could get into combat because of my eyes. So the least I can do is work for the men who fight. These are the planes they have worked on. The youth power of America has helped to put them into the sky. Youth doing its share to win the final victory. <laughs> 